Goedemorgen allemaal en ja, het is dinsdag die 6 november. Net heb ik hier vandaag terugvoer, vir die van julle wat gebid het vir my boetiese sien wat in China aan die tronk is, baie baie dankie. Hulle het om uiteindelik gister gekraai, nadat hy al vrijdag um, gevangene geneem is. Hy is veilig, hy is in aanhouding. <coughs> ons bid nou net vir sy vrylating, so dat hy kan terugkeer uit Afrika toe. En dan is daar van ons mense op ons groepie wat vandag die moeilike werksomstandighede gaan, moeilike financiële omstandighede. Kom ons aan mekaar in gebed. Ons aan mekaar sy hande vast voor die troon van vader. Kijk, ons gaan vandag aan met Genesis, ons straat by session 15, Genesis 8, vers 5 to 22. Jullie lees alles zelf hier. Ik um, ga net voor um, jullie highlight vers 7. Genesis 8, vers 7. And he sent out a raven, which went out back and forth, until the mahim, the water, were dried up from the face of the earth. Just like the ruach over the face of the water in Genesis 1 verse 2, remember, in the beginning when, when God created everything, the Ruach went back and forth over the face of the water and it was also void and there was no life. Just like this raven is now going after the flood, Noah is sending him out, they've um, landed in the ark on mountain of Ararat during the Feast of Tabernacles like we discussed yesterday. And now Noah wants to know, <clears throat> is there any life yet? Is there any um, possibility of them coming out of the ark yet? So he sends out the raven, but the raven goes back and forth over the waters and finds no life. A raven symboli symbolizes an unclean spirit. Remember a raven is part of the unclean foods. We've discussed tahor and tamay, the unclean kosher instructions for life and for health that Father gave us in, uh, in his Torah. So the raven is part of the unclean animals. Why? A raven can eat um, anything rotten and still survives. But let's take a dove. Can a dove eat a rotten carcass and survive? That clearly distinguishes for you the difference between unclean birds and clean birds. But um, So the, the raven in the spiritual, symbolizes an unclean spirit. And the Yonah, the dove, that, that Noah sends out later, as you know, a dove represents the Ruach, the Holy Spirit, the breath of God himself. Just like Johann and John the Baptist saw a dove coming down on the head of Yeshua, in the, the Ruach in the form of a dove. <coughs> the raven goes out and finds no life. He goes out over the water. What does the water symbolize? Yes, there's a lot of symbolism for water. There's a lot of things we can discuss. But in the prophetic sense, what does waters and big bodies and masses of water, what does it represent? Let's look at Revelation 17 verse 15. And he said to me, The waters which you saw, where the whore sits. So, so this is where um, Yeshua is revealing to John the whore of Babylon and all the kings of the earth. And they're sitting on, on, on waters, the, the, the big ocean of water. And he said, the waters which you saw are peoples and crowds and nations and tongues. Very important. Let's think for a for a second, quickly. I don't even have the verse in front of me. Where after Yeshua was resurrected and he was walking on the shore and the um, disciples went back fishing because they didn't really know what to do next. <coughs> so they went back fishing and Yeshua said to them, um, my sons, have you caught anything? They were fishing the whole night and they said, no, 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 if we haven't. There's, there's absolutely no fish in this water. On the Sea of Galilee, there's no fish. And Yeshua said, throw out your net on the other side. And they said, well, we've been fishing the whole night. There is no fish, but we'll, we'll, we'll do what you say. And what happened, guys? Remember, 
suddenly there was a multitude of fish. And I think we have discussed this word multitude. In Greek, ecclesia, and in Hebrew, kahol. And we find it in Genesis, the word kahol, we find in Genesis already, where Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, blesses his son Ephraim, who is the representation of the ten northern tribes that got scattered during the time of Rehoboam, Solomon's son. So, so interesting, guys. And they pulled out 153 fish. Go and read that. And again, if you don't love the Hebrew and you don't love the symbolism and the gematria, not gematria like the Kabbalah the Jews use. They, they take gematria. Gematria is the, the symbolism in, in, um, in numerics. <clears throat> like we know, there's huge symbolism in the number seven, um, which is the perfect number of God. And there's symbolism in the number six, which is the number of man, the number of the beast. Huge symbolism in 10, the 10 northern tribes, the 10 virgins, the 10 camels of Abraham's um, servant when he went to find a wife for Isaac. Ach, it's all over the place. But the gematria of 153, why did they not catch 183 or 123? Why 153 out of the waters? Because the Jews today and the Hebrews of the time of Yeshua knew because the phrase sons of God. We discussed that sons of God is, is angels. And you can read in the context when sons of God is angels. But in the context of the book of Hosea, it says that when my people go away from me, they, they are no longer my people. The book of Hosea is beautiful. Remember, that's where the prophet had to marry the whore and she got children and he called her, her children. The one was, was called Lo Ruchama, No More Mercy. And the other one was called, um, was it Lo Ami, No More My People. And then afterwards he said, but, but I will bring them back and I will forgive them. And they that were not my people, when they return to me, will be called sons of the living God. And the gematria of that phrase is 153. So when Yeshua said, throw out your net, my disciples, into the ocean, into the sea, into the peoples, and see what you can catch out of this ocean of nations and tribes and tongues. See what, you, see what you catch in your net. And they caught 153. How the hell did they know that? Did they physically go and count them? They, they had to because John wrote down 153. And we see the symbolism is so important. Why would John even have thought about going and counting the fish and writing the number down? Because he knew the gematria. 153. The nations has um, the believing seed from the women from the from the garden. We we are scattered in the nations, the people with the with the seed of the tree of life. We are called Israel, those overcoming with Al. Like we've read a million times already, God scatters the ten northern tribes all over the face of the earth. The face of the earth was covered by water in the time of Noah. He sent out the raven. The raven cannot, cannot catch us, cannot find the life. But the Ruach, who searches the heart and the spirit, will find the 153, the sons of the living God, those who has been scattered and who is, be, who is being brought back by the hand of the Messiah, back through the the sword that's going to and fro in front of the entrance back to the tree of life. We've, we've dealt with this. So they catch 153 where they thought in the oceans of people there's no fish because Yeshua said to them, I'll make you fishes of men. So when the disciples were sent out, you'll be my witness. And witness in Greek, go and do your, your e-sword research, is martyr. You'll be my martyrs all over Judea, Samaria, and the and the eight hookah van the order, the corners of the earth. <clears throat> so they can't come and say there's no people believing in the oceans of peoples to the four corners of the earth, because Yeshua says, Don't you worry about it. 
my Ruach will find them and they will bring them back and they will be called sons and daughters of the living Elohim. So Revelation 17, 15 says, The waters which you saw are peoples and crowds and nations and tongues. So the raven, the unclean spirit, going out over the waters or the peoples, does not come back with a branch or a leaf or anything in its beak. Because the sons of God will not come back to him by any other means by no other spirit or no other doctrine or no other religion, but the religion, the doctrine, and the hand of the Ruach HaKodesh, the breath of God, that God himself spoke in the beginning when he said, do not eat from the tree of knowledge because you will die. That Ruach, as he speaks and his word became flesh, and this is our Messiah, and we follow our Messiah on the narrow road. We've discussed this, remember all of this. We follow on the narrow road, because through the Ruach, the angel Gabriel said to Mary, you will conceive the word of God that will become flesh, and you will bear a son, and his name will be called Emmanuel. Israel overcoming with God. Emmanuel, God, is with us. <clears throat> so, neither does the Yonah, the dove, the first time when, he, when Noah sends him out. Neither does he find any life. Uh, let's just find that verse. Verse 8. Also he sent out a dove from him to see if the Mahim were abated from the face of the ground. Verse 9. But... The dove found no rest for the sole of her foot. And yeah, I, I, I don't agree with New Age and all this Kabbalah hogwash that the Ruach is female or a woman. Yes, she is presented, just like wisdom is presented in the Bible many times by female words. But God is not like we say is male or is female or is androgenic. You know what? Just like with God, time and, and space and those things is not relevant. That's our constrictions. Male and female and all these things, it's our constrictions. Let's not try and put God or his spirit or anything into a gender classification. But just reading about the fact that the Ruach found no rest. And I need to quickly take you back, and I don't have the verse in front of me, but when Yeshua sat with a woman by the well, remember, the Samaritan woman, and Samaria, Samaria, those were the, the, the mixed people after um, Nebuchadnezzar took uh, Judah into exile to Babylon. He left only the poorest of the Jews back in Jerusalem area. And then he sent them a priest from, from his Baal doctrines and also people from, from Babel, from, from Babylon. And they mixed, there was intermixing. and so, so the people that was left behind in Jerusalem area became a mixed race. And they had another priest with them that, that didn't, it wasn't a Le Levitical priest. So he didn't teach them the correct Torah. So by the time the Jews came back and they settled back and Yeshua was there, then the Samaritans had a terrible reputation. They were like the dogs. And the Jews always, um, even in, um, when, when Peter was on the roof and Yeshua, Yahuwah showed him the vision of the um, sheet full of unclean animals coming down, he wasn't telling them you can now eat the unclean animals. He was telling that you cannot. What I make holy and kadosh, what I bring back to Israel, you cannot call unclean because they called the Samaritans dogs. So they called any heathen people, any pagans dogs. But the Samaritans weren't pure pagans. They were mixed religion. They worshipped on Mount Gerasim while the Jews worshipped on, on Mount Zion. Go and read for yourself. It's, it's um, I'll see if I can find out. I'll, I'll put it on the group together with the other verses. And he said to her, I am the Messiah. It's a long story. And she, she left her back at there. 
she stopped drinking from that well and she started from that day onwards to drink from the living waters, which is Yeshua. So she went back to Samaria and she was the first witness and she went to the men of the city. And they came out to Yeshua and they asked him, stay with us. And he stayed with them two days. So prophetic. Because like we're going to read now in Romans 11, we're going to, we're going to read it now. I'm going to show you. For 2,000 years, the last 2,000 years, the Jews became blind to give the Gentiles, the dogs, the pagans, the ten northern tribes that got scattered into the heathen tribes, nations and tongues of the world, Deuteronomy 4, 28 to 30, to give them time to come in. So he stayed with them two days, 2,000 years. Yeshua is in the heathen sea, ocean of people for 2,000 years. But in the last days, yes, Judah, the Jews, their eyes will be opened again. But not until the time of the heathens has been completed and all the lost tribes of Israel that has been scattered is brought back. <clears throat> what was I busy saying? He stayed with us two, two year, uh, 2,000 years. And the disciples had to throw in their nets into the ocean, which represents the heathen nations, to find the 153 sons of God. I can't remember what I was busy trying to prove to you guys. <laughs> Let's just continue. Um, oh, yeah, that was right. The, the, the dove couldn't find rest for the sole of her feet the first time that Noah sent her out. So she came back to the ark and he sent her out again. And like the prophecies, and, and this is so exciting, even like in the, in the book of Daniel, and, and like we read together so many times, Deuteronomy 4 verse 30, in the last days after the tribulation, when you are in tribulation in the last days and you obey me, then I will gather you back again. So now is the time. <clears throat> now the Ruach is going out over the waters again, over the oceans of people, tribes and tongues. And she's bringing back something in her mouth. Just like the disciples, after there was no fish for the whole night, brought out of that oceans of people 153 sons of the living God. What did she bring back in her mouth? An olive leaf. The leaf from an olive tree. Why not a cedar or an oak tree? Because those trees are high. You, you can see they're much sooner above the level of the water. Why, an, why did God make the duff find an olive tree? Remember, we, did, we agreed God does nothing. And he writes nothing in his Bible that's not extremely important and significant. We, we cannot read over this fact that she came back with a little olive leaf in her beak. Okay. Jeremiah 11, verse 3 to 16. I'm not going to read everything. Please go and read everything. I'm just going to highlight. And you shall say to them, Thus says Yahuwah, the Elohim of Israel, Cursed is the man who does not obey my covenant, which I commanded your fathers in the day when I brought them out of Egypt. Remember, we, we are also coming out of Egypt when I brought them from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice, and you shall do according to all that I command you, and you shall be my people, sons of the living God, 153 fish brought by the disciples out of the ocean, and I will be your Elohim. Jeremiah 11.5 In order to establish the earth which I have sworn to your fathers, Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, we are the seed of Abram says Yeshua when we believe to give them a land flowing with milk and honey this is the promised land this is where the new Jerusalem will be it's not Johannesburg London New York it's going to be the geographical area of Jerusalem although it's not there now we are we are looking forward to to coming to the ark of the covenant and being safeguarded in the ark like Noah 
landing in the geographical area which we, we, the Messiah will take us back at the Feast of Tabernacles. Like we read yesterday, remember? Genesis 8, verse 4, Feast of Tabernacles. And Jehovah said to me, this is now Jeremiah, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah, number one, and in the streets of Jerusalem, number two. Whenever God speaks, He always distinguishes between Judah and Israel, sometimes Judah and Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is today the city that's whoring, just like the ten northern tribes that's whoring, and we were scattered all over the earth. Always the two houses, remember Remember the parable of the prodigal son. Go and read it over and over again until you can see how the son that stood in the Torah is the son that stayed home. And the son that took his inheritance and he went to spend it on, on luscious, what is that, luscious living. And he ended up amongst the pigs, unclean living but he came back to his father's house. Deuteronomy 4. If after I've scattered you, you will search for me with your whole heart, I will bring you back and you will be my people again. Sons of the living God. 153. Jeremiah 11.15. Why should my beloved be in my house? Why should his bride be inside the ark? She's been unfaithful. She has done wickedness with many. And does the set-apart flesh remove evil from you? Yahweh has named you. So, so he's talking about his bride that, that went whoring after other religions and that he's scattered all over the world and that he's going to bring back. But he has to bring her back into the ark because she has gone out of the ark. And here he says it. Why should my beloved be in my house? I've, I've scattered her all over. But in the last days, like Noah came into the ark, I will bring her back to me. Jeremiah eleven sixteen. I have named you. Who's he speaking to? The two houses, the house of Judah and the house of Israel that went whoring after other religions. I have named you green olive tree. But this God we serve, his love for his bride is so much and he is so full of grace that although we don't deserve to be the olive tree, although we don't deserve to be inside the ark being protected, he teaches us the following, Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7. And Yahuwah passed before him, Moses, and proclaimed, Yahuwah, Yahuwah Elohim, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. This is the God we serve. So although, Jeremiah eleven sixteen, I have named you green olive tree, but with a noise of a great sound, he has set the olive tree on fire, and its branches shall be broken. Now we jump. Now we jump. Romans 11, verse 17 to 27. I'm just going to highlight. Some of the branches were broken off, and you, Israel, the, the heathens, the, the people that is not called by um, the Hebrew name now, Although you, a wild olive tree, were grafted in among the Jewish people in the green olive tree, with them you partake of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Boast not against the branches, the Jews. But if you boast, remember the root, Abram, Isaac and Jacob, the Torah, that bears you. You don't bear the root. You are only grafted in branches. Verse 19, you will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. The Jews were taken out of the picture that I might be grafted in as the heathen people. But remember, Yeshua stayed with the heathen Samaritans for two days. He's inside the, the world, not just 
the Jewish people, is inside the world, given to the Gentiles for 2,000 years. Because the Jews has been blinded for a time so that the heathen can come in and we can become one nation again. So you, so you say, yes, the branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. And Paul says, yes, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. But be not arrogant. Be not arrogant. Heathen people that's believing in the Son of God being Yeshua the Messiah, that is the Word of God that became flesh. Do not be arrogant against your older brother that stayed in the house when you left it. Paul says, be not arrogant, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he spare you not. Behold therefore the goodness of God, on them which fell, severity, but towards you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you shall be cut off as well. If they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, after their eyes are opened, if they shall be grafted back in, for God is able to graft them back in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild, by nature, we are the wild olive tree branches that the, the dove brought back to Noah after she was um, flying over the lifeless waters, the oceans of peoples, tribes, nations and tongues. If you were cut out of the olive tree, which is, by wild, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into the good olive tree, the original one from Jeremiah 11. Because we can't make a new doctrine and a new olive tree. God does not work like that. He does everything he does. is always prophesied. We, we've read this before. He does not um, do anything before he reveals it to his prophets. He revealed to everybody since Noah's time that his people is the olive tree. We can't have a new church or a new olive tree in the New Testament. There's nothing like that. If you, contrary to nature, are grafted into the good olive tree, how much more shall these, and now we're talking about the house of Judah, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? That's why Yeshua cries when he stands on the hill looking out over Jerusalem, over his own people and say, how many times did I want to gather you like a mother hen under my wings, but you would not, you kill the prophets. And Paul says, if I can give my life for my brothers just to come back to the faith. 11.25, for I would not, brethren, <clears throat> says Paul, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. It's a mystery that 99% of churchianity doesn't understand or doesn't want to believe. You should not be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. Wise in our own eyes. No, let's look into the mystery of the duff over the waters of people. Let's look into the mystery of the green olive tree. Let's look into the mystery of the 153 fish. And let, not, let us not be arrogant and let us not be wise in our own eyes anymore. And let's understand. And we're going to come to the last verse and then I'm going to be concluding. Let's understand what the Messiah is doing with the two houses of Abram, Isaac and Jacob. Let's you not be cons uh, wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel shall be saved as it's written. They shall come out of Zion, the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And Jacob has prophesied that Judah will always be the ruler and the leader but that Ephraim will be scattered amongst the nations. For this, says Yahuwah, is my covenant, 
my ark of my covenant, the ark in which Noah came. This is my covenant with them. So the Daf, the Ruach, will come back with Israel, the overcomers with Al, back to the ark, the house of God. And let's end with Ezekiel 37, verse 21-22. Remember everything we've discussed now. See now, my friends, how this comes together in the hand of the Messiah. And I and, and say unto them, this is now Ezekiel, this says the Lord your Elohim, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they have gone. Remember Deuteronomy 4, 28 to 30. And I will gather them on every side. And I will bring them back into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king, the king of kings, shall be king to them all, the son of David. And there shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be no more divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Because in the hand of the Messiah, the broken branches, whether it's the wild branches or the natural branches, will be grafted back into the tree of life. And we will be a chad, one, united. Like Yeshua prays, Father, make them one like we are one. I greet you in the name of this Messiah, in whose hand Jew and Gentile both come back to the tree of life. Both Jew and Gentile turn away from the tree of knowledge and the whispering, deceitful voice of the serpent promising us hogwash he cannot give us. And if any of you don't know what I'm talking about and you've skipped any of the previous Bible studies, you need to start from the beginning so that we can understand how this thousand-piece puzzle comes together only in the hand of of the Word of God, the instructions of God that became life, that became flesh, and that is teaching us the way back to the house of God, back to the beginning, Bereshit, garden, tree of life, truth, everlasting life, immortality, relationship, walking with our Creator in the breeze of the evening, in the hand of the Messiah only through the working of the Ruach HaKadosh, which are given to those who search Him with their whole heart.